volume two chapters nine and ten of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine major allen pays a visit at bath productive of important results sympathy between himself and the widow barnaby exchange is no robbery valedictory compliments the adventures of major allen have no connection with this narrative excepting as far as the widow barnaby is concerned and therefore with his business at bath or anything he did there we have nothing to do beyond recording about ten minutes conversation which he chanced to have with one individual of a party with whom he passed the evening after his arrival among the many men of various ages who were accustomed to meet together wherever those who lived by their wits were likely to prosper there was on this occasion one young man who had but recently evinced the bad ambition of belonging to the set major allen had never seen him before but hearing him named as a famous fine fellow who was likely to do them honour he scrupled not to converse with perfect freedom before him the most interesting thing he had to record since the party last met was the history of his engagement with the widow barnaby whom he very complacently described as extremely handsome passionately in love with him and possessed of a noble fortune both in money and land the nestor of the party asked him with very friendly anxiety if he had been careful to ascertain what the property really was as it was no uncommon thing for handsome widows to appear richer than they were thank you for nothing most sage conjurer replied the gay major age has not thinned my flowing hair but i'm not such a greenhorn neither as to walk blindfold in the first place the lady is sister-in-law to old peters one of the wealthiest of turtle-eaters and it was from one of his daughters that i learned the real state of her affairs an authority that may be the better depended on because though they receive her as a sister and all that it is quite evident that they are by no means very fond of her in fact they are rather a stiff-backed generation whereas my widow is as gay as a lark is she a bristol woman inquired one of the party no she is from devonshire was the reply the name of her place is silverton park silverton in devonshire said the young stranger may i ask the lady's name sir her name is barnaby replied major allen briskly do you happen to know anything about her the widow barnaby of silverton oh to be sure i do and a fine woman she is too no doubt of it she is the widow of our apothecary the widow of an apothecary no such thing sir you mistake altogether replied the major do you happen to know such a place as silverton park i never heard of such a park sir but i know silverton well enough said the young man and i know her house or what was her house as well as i know my own father's which is at no great distance from it neither and i know the shop and the bow window belonging to it and a very pretty decent dwelling house it is major allen grew fidgety he wanted to hear more but he did not approve the publicity of the conversation and contrived at the moment to put a stop to it but contrived also to make an appointment with his new acquaintance to breakfast together on the following morning and before their allowance of tea and toast was dispatched major allen was not only fully disenchanted respecting silverton park and the four beautiful greys but quite au fait of the reputation for running up bills which his charmer had enjoyed previous to her marriage with the worthy apothecary it was this latter portion of the discourse which completed the extinction of the major's passion and this so entirely that he permitted himself not to inquire as he easily might have done into the actual state of the widow's finances but feeling himself on the edge of a very frightful precipice he ran off in the contrary direction too fast to see if there were any safe mode of descending without a tumble it may indeed be doubted whether the snug little property actually in possession of his juno would have been sufficient for his honourable ambition even had he been as sure of her having and holding it as she was herself for to say the truth he rated his own price in the matrimonial market rather highly had great faith in the power of his height and fashionable tournure and confidence unbounded in his large eyes and collier grec it is true indeed that he had failed more than once and that too when the fair cause of all his pain had given him great reason to believe that she admired him much nevertheless his self-approval was in no degree lessened thereby nor was it likely to be so long as he could oil and trim his redundant whiskers without discovering a grey hair in them in short what with his well-sustained value for himself 
and his much depreciated value for the widow he left bath boiling with rage at the deception practised upon him and arrived at clifton determined to trust to his skill for obtaining a peaceful restitution of the promise of marriage without driving his juno to any measures that might draw upon them the observation of the public a tribunal before which he was by no means desirous of appearing the state of mrs barnaby's mind respecting this same promise of marriage has already been described wherefore it may be perceived that when major allen made his next morning visit at sion row a much greater degree of sympathy existed between himself and the widow than either imagined it was in the tactics of both however to meet without any appearance of diminished tenderness and when he entered with a smile that had so often gladdened her fond heart she stretched out a hand to welcome him with such softness of aspect as made the deluded gentleman tremble to think how difficult a task lay before him neither was mrs barnaby's heart at all more at ease who could doubt the sincerity of the ardent pressure with which that hand was held who could have thought that while gazing upon her in silence that seemed to indicate feelings too strong for words he was occupied solely in meditating how best he could get rid of her for ever the conversation was preluded by a pretty well-sustained passage of affectionate inquiries concerning the period of absence and then the major ejaculated yes my sweet friend i have been well in health but it is inconceivable what fancies a man truly in love finds to torment himself whilst the widow mentally answered him perhaps you were afraid i might see your friend maintry stuck up in the pillory or peeping at me through the country prison windows but aloud she only said with a smile a little forced what fancies major i am almost afraid to tell you he replied you will think me so weak so capricious this word capricious sounded pleasantly to the widow's ears it seemed to hint at some change some infidelity that might make her task an easier one than she expected and assuming an air of gaiety she said nay if such be the case speak out without a shadow of reserve major allen for i assure you there is nothing in the world i admire so much as sincerity sincerity muttered the half-entrapped fortune-hunter aside confound her sincerity and then replied aloud will you promise me dear friend to forgive me if i confess to you a fond folly mrs barnaby quaked all over she felt as if fresh grappling irons had been thrown over her and that escape was impossible nay really said she after a moment's reflection i think fond follies are too young a joke for us major they may do very well for agnes perhaps but i think you and i ought to know better by this time if i can but make him quarrel with me thought she that would be better still if i can but once more coax her to let me have my way thought he the business would be over in a moment beauty like yours is of no age he exclaimed it is immortal as the passion it inspires and when joined with such a heart and temper as you possess becomes i do assure you major said the widow interrupting him rather sharply you will do wrong if you reckon much upon my temper it never was particularly good and i can't say i think it grows better oh say not so for this very hour i am going to put it to the test i want you to pray major do not ask me to do anything particularly obliging for to say the truth i am in no humour for it it has occurred to me more than once major allen since you set off so suddenly that it is likely enough there may be another lady in the case and that the promise you got out of me was perhaps for no other purpose in the world but to make fun of me by showing it to her hell and furies growled the major inwardly she will stick to me like a leech oh dream not of such villainy he exclaimed it was concerning that dear promise that i wished to speak to you my sweet martha methinks that promise i tell you what major allen cried the widow vehemently if you don't let me see that promise this very moment nothing on earth shall persuade me that you have not given it in jest to some other woman good heaven he replied what a moment have you chosen for the expression of this cruel suspicion i was on the very verge of telling you that i deemed such a promise unworthy a love so pure so perfect as ours and therefore if you would indulge my fond desire you would let each of us receive our promise back again the major was really and truly in a state of the most violent perturbation as he uttered these words fearing that the fond and jealous widow might suspect the truth and hold his pledge with a tenacity beyond his power to conquer 
he had however no sooner spoken than a smile of irrepressible delight banished the frowns in which she had dressed herself and she uttered in a voice of the most unaffected satisfaction if you will really do that major allen i can't suspect any longer you know that you have given mine to any one else assuredly not most beautiful angel cried the delighted lover thus then let us give back these paper ties and be bound only by the widow stretched out her hand for the document which he had already taken from his pocket-book but to yield this though he had no wish to keep it was not the object nearest his heart holding it therefore playfully above his head he said let not one of us dearest seem more ready than the other in this act of mutual confidence give mine with one hand as you receive your own with the other now then said mrs barnaby eagerly extending both her hands in order at once to give and take now then replied the major joyously imitating her action and the next instant each had seized the paper held by the other with an avidity greatly resembling that with which a zealous player pounces upon the king when she has the ace in the hand at shorts now mrs barnaby i will wish you good morning said the gentleman as he tore the little document to atoms i have been fortunate enough since i last enjoyed the happiness of seeing you to discover the exact locality of silverton park and the precise pedigree of your beautiful greys the equanimity of the widow was shaken for a moment but no longer she too had been doing her best to annihilate the precious morsel of paper and rising majestically she scattered the fragments on the ground saying in a tone at least as triumphant as his own and i major allen or whatever else your name may chance to be have since last i had the felicity of seeing you enjoyed the edifying spectacle of beholding your friend captain maitry alias purdham in the hands of justice for assisting your faithful servant william in breaking open my boxes and robbing me should the circumstance be still unknown to you i fear you may be disappointed to hear that both my money and plate have been recovered there may be some fanciful difference between silverton park and a snug property at silverton but i rather suspect that of the two i have gained most by our morning's work farewell sir if you will take my advice you will not continue much longer in clifton i may feel myself called upon to hint to the magistrates that it might assist the ends of justice if you were taken up and examined as an accomplice in this affair the lady had decidedly the best of it as ladies always should have for the crestfallen major looked as if he must had he been poetically inclined have exclaimed in the words of comus she fables not i feel that i do fear and without any farther attempt to carry off the palm of victory he made his way downstairs and it is now many years since he has been heard of in the vicinity of clifton chapter ten a disagreeable breakfast-table mr stephenson gives his friend colonel hubert warning to depart a proposal and its consequences mrs barnaby and major allen were not the only persons to whom that twenty sixth of april proved an eventful day colonel hubert and his friend stephenson met as usual at the breakfast-table and it would be difficult to say which of them was the most preoccupied and the most unfit for ordinary conversation stephenson however though vexed at not being already the betrothed husband of his lovely agnes was full of hopeful anticipation and his unfitness for conversation arose rather from the fulness of his heart than the depression of his spirits not so colonel hubert it was hardly possible to suffer from a greater feeling of melancholy dissatisfaction with all things than he did on the morning after mrs peter's concert that the despised agnes the niece of the hateful mrs barnaby had risen in his estimation to be considered as the best the first the loveliest of created beings was not the worst misfortune that had fallen upon him there was indeed a degree of perversity in the case that almost justified his thinking himself the most unfortunate of mortals after having attained the sober age of thirty-seven years if not untouched at least uninjured by all the reiterated volleys which he had stood from cupid's quiver it was certainly rather provoking to find himself falling distractedly in love with a little obscure girl young enough to be his daughter and perhaps from the unhappy circumstance of her dependence upon such a relative as mrs barnaby the very last person in the world with whom he would have wished to connect himself this was bad enough but even this was not all with the airs of a senior and a mentor 
he had taken upon himself to lecture his friend upon the preposterous absurdity of giving way to such an attachment thus rendering it almost morally impossible for him under any imaginable circumstances to ask the love of agnes even though something in his inmost heart whispered to him that he should not ask in vain nor did the catalogue of his embarrassments end here for he was placed vis-a-vis -vis to his open-hearted friend who he was quite certain would within five minutes begin again the oft-repeated confidential avowal of his love accompanied probably with renewed assurances of his intentions to make proposals which colonel hubert from what he had seen last night fancied himself quite sure would never be accepted what a wretched what a hopeless dilemma was he placed in was he to see the man he professed to love expose himself to the misery of offering his hand in defiance of a thousand obstacles to a woman who he felt almost sure would reject him or could he interfere to prevent it at the very moment that his heart told him nothing but the pretensions of frederick could prevent his proposing to her himself colonel hubert sat stirring his coffee in moody silence and dreading to hear frederick open his lips but his worst fears as to what he might utter were soon realized by stephenson's exclaiming well hubert it is still to do i was defeated last night but it shall not be my fault if i go to rest this without receiving her promise to become my wife her aunt is a horror a monster anything everything you may please to call her but agnes is an angel and agnes must be mine colonel hubert looked more gloomy still but he continued to stir his coffee and said nothing how can you treat me thus hubert said the young man reproachfully there is a proud superiority in the affected silence a thousand times more mortifying than are things you could say begin again to revile me as heretofore for my base endurance of a barnaby describe the vexation of my brother the indignation of my sisters that would be infinitely more endurable than such contemptuous silence my dear dear frederick i know not what to say replied the agitated hubert had my words the power to make you leave this place within the hour i would use my last breath to speak them for certain am i frederick i am almost surely certain that this suit can bring you nothing but misery and disappointment let me acknowledge that the young lady herself is worthy of all love admiration and reverence i truly think so i believe it i am sure of it but and here colonel hubert stopped short resumed his coffee-cup and said no more this is intolerable sir said the vexed frederick go on if you please say all you have to say but stop not thus at unshaped insinuations more injurious more insulting far than anything your eloquence could find the power to utter frederick you mistake me i insinuate nothing i believe in my inmost soul that agnes willoughby is one of the most faultless beings upon earth but this will not prevent your suit to her from being a most unhappy one forget her frederick travel awhile my dear friend leave her stephenson and your future years will be the happier colonel hubert the difference in our ages is your only excuse for the unnatural counsel you so coldly give you are no longer a young man sir you no longer are capable of judging for one who is and i confess to you that for the present i think our mutual enjoyment would rather be increased than lessened were we to separate if i remember rightly you purposed when we came here to stay only till your sister's marriage was over it is now a fortnight since that event took place and it is probably solely out of a compliment to me that you remain here if so let me release you in future times i hope we may meet with pleasanter feelings than any we can share at present and besides my stay here which for aught i know may be prolonged for months will under probable circumstances throw me a good deal into intimacy and intercourse with your detested mrs barnaby wherein i certainly cannot wish or desire that you should follow me and therefore all things considered you must hold me excused if i say that i should hear of your departure from clifton with pleasure colonel hubert rose from his seat and walked about the room he felt that his heart was softer at that moment than befitted the age with which frederick reproached him he was desired to absent himself by one for whose warm-hearted young love he had perhaps neglected the soberer friendships of superior men and that too at a moment when he felt that he more than ever deserved a continuance of that love was he not at that instant crushing with spartan courage a passion within his own breast which he believed secretly silently unacknowledged even to his own heart to be returned 
and this terrible sacrifice was made not because his pride opposed his yielding to it but because he could not have endured the idea of supplanting frederick even when it should be acknowledged that no shadow of hope remained for him and for this it was that he was thus insultingly desired to depart generous hubert a few moments struggle decided him he resolved to go and that immediately he would not remain to witness the broken spirit of his hot-headed friend after he should have received the refusal which as he so strongly suspected awaited him neither would he expose himself to the danger of seeing agnes afterwards without as yet replying to frederick he rang the bell and desired that post-horses might immediately be ordered for his carriage and his valet told to prepare his trunks for travelling with as little delay as possible these directions given the friends were once more tete-a-tete -tete, and then colonel hubert ventured to trust his voice and answer the harsh language he had received frederick he said you have spoken as you would not have done had you given yourself a little more time for consideration for you have spoken unkindly and unjustly i would still prevail on you if i could to turn away from this lovely girl without committing yourself by making her an offer of marriage i would strongly advise this i would strongly advise your remembering while it is yet time the pang it may cost you should anything in short believe me you would suffer less by leaving clifton immediately with me than by remaining under circumstances which i am sure will turn out inimical to your happiness will you be advised and let us depart together no colonel hubert i will not i have no wish to detain you i have already said this with sufficient frankness be equally wise on your side and do not attempt to drag me away in your train these were pretty nearly the last words which were exchanged between them frederick stephenson soon left the house to wander about till the hour arrived for making his visit in rodney place and in less than two hours colonel hubert was driving rapidly through bristol on his way to london as soon as mrs barnaby and the friendly mr peters were fairly off the premises and on their road to look after the thief mary called a consultation on the miserably jaded looks of poor agnes and having her own particular reasons for not choosing that she should look half dead inasmuch as she was persuaded the promised visit of frederick was not intended to be for nothing she peremptorily insisted upon her taking sal volatile bathing her eyes in cold water and then either lying on the sofa or taking a walk upon the down till luncheon-time that being the usual hour of mr stephenson's morning visits agnes submitted herself very meekly to all this discipline save the depositing herself on the sofa to which she objected vehemently deciding for the walk on the down as the only thing at all likely to cure her headache it was on their way to this favourite magazine of fresh air that mr stephenson met them to agnes the rencontre was an extreme annoyance for she wanted to be quiet and this was what frederick stephenson never permitted her to be but she could not run away and so she continued to walk on till just after passing the turnpike she discovered that mary and elizabeth peters were considerably in their rear this tete-a-tete -tete, however cost her not the slightest embarrassment and if she was to be talked to instead of being permitted to sink into the dark but downy depths of meditation which was now her greatest indulgence it mattered very little to her who was the talker she stopped however from politeness to her friends and a sort of natural instinct of bienseance towards herself saying i was not aware mr stephenson that we had been walking so fast i think we had better turn back to them may i entreat you miss willoughby said the young man to remain a few moments longer alone with me it is not that you have walked fast but your friends have walked slowly for they at least i plainly perceive have read my secret and it is possible that you agnes have not read it also is it possible that you have yet to learn how fervently i love you no young girl hears such an avowal as this for the first time without feeling considerable agitation and embarrassment but many things contributed to increase these feelings tenfold in the case of agnes for first which is rarely the case the declaration was wholly unexpected secondly it was wholly unwelcome and thirdly it inspired a feeling of acute terror lest flattering and advantageous as she knew such a proposal to be it might tempt her friends or set on her terrible aunt to disturb her with solicitations which by only hearing them would profane the sentiment to which she had secretly devoted herself for ever greatly however as she wished to answer him at once and definitely she was unable to articulate a single word will you not speak to me agnes resumed frederick after a painful pause will you not tell me what i may hope in return for the truest affection that ever warmed the heart of man will you not even look at me 
agnes now stood still as if to recover breath she knew that he had a right to expect an answer from her and she knew that sooner or later she should be compelled to speak it so making an effort as great perhaps in its self-command as many that have led a hero to eternal fame she said but without raising her eyes from the ground mr stephenson i am very sorry indeed that you love me because it is quite quite impossible i should ever love you in return good god miss willoughby it is thus you answer me do you know that the words you utter so lightly so coldly must if persisted in doom me to a life of misery can you hear this agnes and feel no touch of pity pray do not talk in that way mr stephenson it gives me so very much pain then you will unsay those cruel words you will tell me that time and faithful constant love may do something for me oh tell me it shall be so but i cannot tell you so mr stephenson said agnes with the most earnest emphasis it would be most wicked to do so because it would be untrue you are very young and very gay mr stephenson and i cannot think that what i have said can vex you long particularly if you will believe it at once and talk no more about it and now i think that we had better walk back to mary if you please having said this she turned about and began to walk rapidly towards clifton can this be possible said the young man greatly agitated so young and seemingly so gentle and yet so harsh and so determined oh agnes why did you not let me guess this end to all my hopes before they had grown so strong you must have seen my love my adoration you must have known that every earthly hope for me depended upon you no 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 cried agnes greatly distressed i never knew it i never guessed it how should i guess what was so very unlikely unlikely are you laughing at me agnes unlikely ask your friends ask miss peters if she thought it unlikely i do not believe so strange a thought ever entered her head mr stephenson for if it had i am sure she would have put me on my guard against it on your guard against it miss willoughby what is there in my situation fortune or character that should render it necessary for your friend to put you on your guard against me surely you use strange language then do not make me talk any more about it mr stephenson it is very likely that i may express myself amiss for i am so sorry and so vexed that indeed i hardly know what to say but pray forgive me and do not be unhappy about me any longer agnes you love another suddenly exclaimed frederick his face becoming crimson there is no other way of accounting for such cold indifference such hard insensibility agnes coloured as violently in her turn and bursting into tears said with great displeasure that is what nobody in the world has a right to say to me and i will never if i can help it permit you to say it again she now increased her speed and had nearly reached the mrs peters notwithstanding all the beautiful summer flowers they had found by the wayside saying no more in reply either to the remonstrances or the passionate pleadings of mr stephenson when at length he laid his hand upon her arm and detained her a while he said agnes if you accept my love and consent to be my wife i will release you from the power of your aunt place you in a splendid home and surround you with friends as pure-minded and as elegant as yourself is this nothing answer me then one word and one word only is your refusal of my hand and my affection final yes sir said agnes still weeping for his accusation of her having another love continued to ring in her ears and make her heart swell almost to bursting speak not in anger agnes said he mildly what i have felt for you does not deserve such a return i know it i know it replied agnes weeping more violently still and i am very wrong as well as very unhappy pray mr stephenson forgive me and she held out her hand to him he took it and held it for a moment between both his unhappy agnes he said why should you be unhappy oh if my love my devotion could render you otherwise but you will not trust me you will not let me pass my life in labouring to make yours happy nothing can make me happy mr stephenson pray do not talk any more about it for indeed indeed i cannot be your wife he abruptly raised her hand to his lips and then let it fall may heaven bless and make you happy in your own way whatever that may be he cried 
and turning from her reached the verge of the declivity that overhung the river then plunging down it with very heedless haste he was out of sight immediately this was a catastrophe wholly unexpected by miss peters who now hastened to meet the disconsolate looking agnes what in the world could you have said to him my dear to send him off in that style i trust that you have not quarrelled most unfeignedly distressed and embarrassed was agnes at this appeal and the more so because her friend mary was not alone to her perhaps she might have been able to tell the terrible adventure which had befallen her but before elizabeth it was impossible and pressing mary's arm she said in a whisper ask me no questions dearest mary now for i cannot answer them wait only till we get home but to wait in a state of such tormenting uncertainty was beyond the philosophy of mary so she suddenly stopped saying elizabeth walk on slowly for a few minutes will you i have something that i particularly wish to say to agnes and the good-natured elizabeth walked on without ever turning her head to look back at them what has happened what has he said to you and what have you said to him hastily inquired the impatient friend oh mary he has made me so very unhappy and the whole thing is so extremely strange i cannot hide anything from you mary but it will kill me should you let my aunt hear of it he has made me an offer mary of course agnes i know he has but how does that account for his running off in that strange wild way and how does it account for your crying and looking so miserable why did he run away as if he were afraid to see us agnes and when are you going to see him again i shall never see him again mary said agnes gravely then you have quarrelled good heaven what folly i suppose he said something about your aunt that you fancied was not civil but all things considered agnes ought you not to have forgiven it indeed mary he said nothing that was rude about my aunt and i am sure he did not mean to be uncivil in any way though certainly he hurt and offended me very much but perhaps he did not intend it hurt and offended you agnes let me beg you to tell me at once what it was he did say to you i will tell you everything but one and that i own to you i had rather not repeat and it does not signify for that was not the reason he ran off so and what was the reason a very foolish one indeed and i am sure you will laugh at it it was only because i said i could not marry him you said that agnes you said you could not marry him yes i did i do not wish to marry him indeed i would not marry him for the world and this is the end of it all exclaimed miss peters with much vexation i have much mistaken you agnes i thought you were suffering greatly from being dependent on your aunt barnaby and do you doubt it now mary how can i continue to think this when you have just refused an offer of marriage from a young man well born nobly allied with a splendid fortune extremely handsome and possessed as i truly believe of more excellent and amiable qualities and often fall to the share of any mortal how can i believe after this that you really feel unhappy from the circumstances of your present situation all you say is very true and i cannot deny a word of it but what can one do mary if one does not happen to love a man you would not have one marry him would you how like a child you talk why should you not love him with manners so agreeable such excellent qualities and a fortune beyond that of many noblemen but you don't suppose i could love him the better for his being rich do you mary you are a little fool agnes and i know not what to suppose perhaps my dear you think him too old for you perhaps you will not choose to fall in love till you meet an adonis about your own age it is you who are talking nonsense now replied agnes with some warmth so far from his being too old i think that is to say i don't think i mean that i suppose everybody would think people a great deal older might be a great deal but this is all nothing to the purpose mary i would not marry mr stephenson if but let us say no more on the subject only for pity's sake do not let my aunt know anything about it she shall not hear it from me agnes replied miss peters but i cannot understand you you have disappointed me however i have no right to be angry and so as you say we will talk no more about it come let us overtake elizabeth we must not let her go all the way to clifton in solitary state and so ended the very promising trial at matchmaking upon which the pretty mary peters had wasted so many useless meditations it was a useful lesson to her for she has never been known to interfere in any affair of the kind since 
End of chapters 9 and 10volume two chapter eleven of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven mrs barnaby feels conscious of improvement and rejoices at it hopes for the future a conversation in which much generous sincerity is displayed a letter intended to be explanatory but failing to be so mrs barnaby's first feelings after the major left her were agreeable enough she had escaped with little injury from a great danger and while believing herself infinitely wiser than before she was conscious of no reason that should either lower her estimate of herself or check the ambitious projects with which she had set forth from her native town to push her fortune in the world but her views were improved and enlarged her experience was more practical and enlightened and her judgment as to those trifling fallacies by which people of great ability are enabled to delude people of little though in no degree changed as to its morale was greatly purified and sharpened as to the means to be employed thus by way of example it may be mentioned that during the hour of mental examination which followed major allen's adieu mrs barnaby determined never again to mention silverton park and if at any time led to talk of her favourite greys that the pastures they fed in and the roads they traversed should on no account be particularly specified neither her courage nor her hopes were at all lowered by this her first adventure on the contrary by setting her to consider from whence arose the blunder it led her to believe that her danger had been occasioned solely by her own too great humility in not having soared high enough to seek her quarry in making new acquaintance thus ran her soliloquy in making new acquaintance the rank and station of the party should be too unequivocal to render a repetition of such danger possible i was to blame in so totally neglecting the evident admiration of colonel hubert in order to gratify the jealous feelings of major allen that was a man to whom i might have devoted myself without danger his family and fortune known to all the world and himself so every way calculated to do me honour but it is too late now his feelings have been too deeply wounded i cannot forget the glances of jealous anger which i have seen him throw on that unworthy allen but my time must not be wasted in regrets i must look forward and look forward she did with a very bold and dashing vein of speculation although for the present moment her power of putting any new plans in action was greatly paralysed by her having been bound over to prosecute betty jacks and her accomplices at the next bristol assizes now bristol and its vicinity had become equally her contempt and aversion the major had taught her to consider the trade won wealth of the peterses as something derogatory to her dignity and though she still hoped to make them useful she had altogether abandoned the notion that they could make her great during the time that it would be necessary for her to remain at clifton however she determined to maintain as much intimacy with them as their very stiff manners would permit and carefully to avoid anything approaching to another affair of the heart till she should have left their neighbourhood and the scene of her late failure behind as soon as her spirits had recovered the double shock they had received from the perfidies of betty jacks and major allen she remembered with great satisfaction the discovery made of agnes's singing powers though more than eighteen years had passed since her musical father and mother had warbled together for the delight of the silverton soirees mrs barnaby had not forgotten the applause their performances used to elicit nor the repeated assurances of the best informed among their auditors that the voices of both were of very first-rate quality the belief that agnes inherited their powers now suggested more than one project in the first place it would make the party she was determined to give extremely attractive and might very probably be sufficient to render her at once the fashion either at cheltenham which she intended should be the scene of her next campaign or anywhere else where it was her will and pleasure to display it nor was this ornamental service the only one to which she thought it possible she might convert the voice of agnes she knew that the exploits she contemplated were hazardous as well as splendid and that although success was probable failure might be possible in which case she might fall back on this newly discovered treasure and either marry her niece or put her on the stage or make her a singing mistress as she would find most feasible and convenient with these notions in her head she attacked agnes on the singular concealment of her talent as well as upon other matters during breakfast the morning after the unlamented major's departure which was in fact the first time they had been alone together agnes having passed the whole of the preceding day at rodney place 
in answer to her niece's gentle salutation she said in a tone very far from amiable though it affected to be so yes yes good morning aunt that's all very well and now please to tell me where i shall find another young lady living with a generous relation to whom she owes her daily bread who knowing that relation's anxiety about everything concerning her has chosen to make a secret of the only thing on earth she can do tell me if you can where i shall find anything like that if you mean my singing aunt i have told you already why i never said anything about it my only reason was because i did not like to ask you for a piano that's all hypocrisy miss agnes and let who will be taken in by you i am not and you may just remember that miss now and always you were afraid perhaps that i might make you of some use to me but the scheme won't answer with the kindest temper in the world i have plenty of resolution to do just whatever i think right and that's what i shall do by you i shall say no more about it in this nasty vulgar merchandising sort of place but as soon as we get among ladies and gentlemen that i consider my equals i shall begin to give regular parties like other people of fashion and then let me hear you refuse to sing when i ask you and we shall see what will happen next indeed aunt i believe you are mistaken about my voice replied agnes i have never had teaching enough to enable me to sing so well as you seem to suppose and in fact i know little or nothing about it except what dear good mr wilmot used to tell me and i don't believe he has heard any really good singing for the last twenty years and i was not at mrs peters the other night i suppose miss willoughby and i did not hear all the praise and the rapture and the fuss didn't i what a fool you do seem to take me for agnes however i don't mean to quarrel with you you know what sacrifices i have made and not all your bad behaviour shall prevent my making more still for you you shall have a master if i find you want one and when we get to cheltenham you shall be sure to have a pianoforte does that please you i shall be very glad to be able to practise again aunt only only what if you please why i mean to say that i should be sorry you should expect to make a great performer of me for i am certain that you will be disappointed stuff and nonsense don't trouble yourself about my disappointments i'll take care to get what i want and there's another talent miss agnes which i shall expect to find in you and i hope you have made a secret of that too for i never saw much sign of it i want you to be very active and clever and to act as my maid till i get one indeed i'm not sure i shall ever get one again they seem to be such plagues and if i find you ain't too great a fool to do what i want i have a notion that i shall take a tiger instead it will be much more respectable pray agnes have you any idea about dressing hair i think i could do it as well for you aunt as jerningham did replied agnes with perfect good humour and that's not quite so well as i want but i suppose you know that as well as i do only you choose to show off your impertinence and there's my drawers to keep in order dunce as you are i suppose you can do that and fifty other little things there will be now that good-for-nothing baggage is gone which i promise you i do not intend to do for myself did agnes repent having sent the enamoured possessor of seven thousand a year from her in despair as she listened to this sketch of her future occupations no not for a moment no annoyances that her aunt could threaten no escape from them that mr stephenson could offer had the power of mastering in her mind the one prominent idea which like the rod of the chosen priest swallowed up all the rest and this engrossing this cherished this secretly hoarded idea how was it nurtured and sustained did the object of it return to occupy every hour of her life by giving her looks words and movements to meditate upon no colonel hubert appeared no more at clifton and agnes notwithstanding the flashes of fond hope that like the soft gleaming of the glow-worm had occasionally brightened the gloom of her prospects was left to suppose that he had taken his departure in company with his offended friend and that she should probably never hear of him more was he then angry at her refusal was the notice he had taken of her for his friend's pleasure rather than his own poor agnes there was great misery in this thought they had indeed both left clifton on the same day though they had not left it together but that she knew not colonel hubert as we have seen was already on his way to london when the impetuous frederick staked all his dearest hopes upon his sanguine but most mistaken judgment of a young girl's heart 
and when the ill-fated experiment was over he posted with all speed across the country to southampton and there embarked to take refuge among the hills and the orchards of normandy the recollection of the manner in which he had driven colonel hubert from him was no slight aggravation of his unhappiness when he gave himself time to take breath and to reflect a little he felt deeply bitterly the loss of agnes but perhaps he felt more bitterly still the loss of his friend the first as he could not help confessing to himself was the loss of a good he had possessed only in his own fond fancy the last was that of the most substantial good that man can possess a tried attached and honourable friend for many days and many nights too frederick suffered sorely from the battle that was going on between his pride and his consciousness of having been wrong but happily for his repose his pride at length gave way and the following letter was written and directed to the united service club whence sooner or later he knew it would reach the friend to whom it was addressed most men my dear hubert would be too angry at the petulance i exhibited during our last interview even to receive an apology for it but you are not one of them and you will let me tell you without receiving the confession too triumphantly that i have never known a moment's peace from that day to this nor ever shall till you send me your forgiveness as frankly as i ask it you may do this with the more safety dear hubert because we shall never again quarrel on the same occasion and so perfectly have i found you to be right in all you said and all you hinted on that fair but unfortunate subject that henceforward i think i shall be afraid to pronounce upon the colour of a lady's hair or the tincture of her skin till i have heard your judgment thereon let us therefore never talk again either of the terrible mrs barnaby or her beautiful niece but forgetting that anything of the kind could breed discord between us remember only that i am and ever must be your most affectionate friend frederick stephenson how many times did colonel hubert read over this letter before he could satisfy himself that he understood it this is a question that cannot be answered because he never did by means of these constantly repeated readings ever arrive at any such conclusion at all had mrs barnaby's name been altogether omitted he might have fancied that his own deep but unacknowledged belief that miss willoughby would refuse his friend had been manifest in the dissuasive words he had spoken notwithstanding his caution but this allusion to the widow who had so repeatedly been the theme of his prophetic warnings left him at liberty to suppose that frederick's solitary and repentant rumination upon all he had propounded on that fertile subject had finally induced him to give up the pursuit and to leave clifton without having proposed to her niece anything more destructive to the tranquillity of colonel hubert than this doubt can hardly be imagined he had long persuaded himself it is true that it was impossible under any circumstances he could ever confess to agnes what his own feelings were as his friendship for stephenson must put it totally out of his power to do so the frankness of frederick's early avowal of his passion to him and the style and tone of the opposition with which he had met it must inevitably lay him under such an imputation of dishonour if he addressed her himself as he could not bear to think of nevertheless he felt or fancied that he should be much more tranquil and resigned could he have known to a certainty whether stephenson had proposed to her or not it was long however ere any opportunity of satisfying himself on this point arose the reconciliation indeed between himself and his friend was perfect and their letters breathed the same spirit of affectionate confidence as heretofore but how could colonel hubert abuse this confidence by asking a question which could not be answered in any way without opening afresh the wound that he feared still rankled in the breast of his friend it would be selfish and ungenerous in the extreme and must not be thought of but this forbearance robbed the high-minded hubert of the only consolation that his situation left him namely the belief that the young agnes notwithstanding the disparity in their years had been too near loving him to accept the hand of another of the two interpretations to which the letter of frederick was open this the most flattering to himself was the one that faded fastest away from the mind of colonel hubert till he hardly dared remember that he had once believed it possible and he finally remained with the persuasion that his too tractable friend had yielded to his arguments against the marriage without ever having put the feelings of agnes to the test which he would have given the world to believe had been tried and been withstood End of chapter eleven volume two chapter twelve of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve a lucky escape a melancholy parting mrs barnaby settles herself at cheltenham 
her first sortie boarding-house breakfast a new acquaintance a medical conversation in addition to mrs barnaby's pretty strong confidence in herself and her own devices she soon learned to think that she was very especially favoured by fortune for just as she began to find her idle and most unprofitable abode at clifton intolerably tedious and that the recovery of her property hardly atoned for the inconvenience of being obliged to prosecute those who had stolen it she received the welcome intelligence that the trio had escaped by means of the superior ingenuity of captain maintry alias Purdom the ends of justice being considerably less dear to the widow's heart than the end of the adventures she promised herself at cheltenham she welcomed the intelligence most joyfully and set about her preparations for departure without an hour's delay several elegant shops at clifton had so earnestly requested the honour of her name upon their books that mrs barnaby had found it impossible to refuse and the consequence was that when she announced her intended departure so unexpected an amount of mere nothings crowded in upon her that she would have been considerably embarrassed had not the manner of raising money during the last years of her father's life been fresh in her memory showing her as her property was all in the funds and happily or unhappily standing in her own name that nothing could be more easy than to write to her broker and order him to sell out a couple of hundreds confidence in one's self the feeling that there is power within us of a sufficient strength to reach the goal we have in view is in general a useful as well as pleasant state of mind but in mrs barnaby it was very likely to prove otherwise in all her meditations in all her plottings in all her reasonings she saw nothing before her but success the alternative and all its possible consequences never suggested itself to her as possible and therefore no portion of her clever ingenuity was ever employed even in speculation to ward it off in a word then her bills which by the by were wholly and solely for her own dress were all paid without difficulty or delay and the day was fixed for the departure of herself and agnes by a stage-coach from bristol to cheltenham poor agnes wept bitterly as she received the affectionate farewells of her friends in rodney place and mary who really loved her wept too though it is possible that the severe disappointment which had attended her matrimonial project for her had a little dulled the edge of the enthusiasm at first excited by the sweetness and beauty of the poor motherless girl but under no circumstances could the grief of miss peters at losing sight of her have been comparable to that felt by agnes herself how little had the tyranny of mrs barnaby and all the irksome desagrements of her home occupied her attention during the month she had spent at clifton how completely it had all been lost sight of in the society of mary and the hospitable kindness of rodney place but oh the heavy change that which had been chased by the happy lightness of her young spirit as a murky cloud is chased by the bright sun of april now rolled back upon her like a storm that was to last for ever she knew it she felt its approach and like a frightened fawn trembled as she gazed around and saw no shelter near you will write to me dear agnes said mary i shall think of you very often and it will be a real pleasure to hear from you and to write to you mary will be by far the greatest pleasure i can possibly have but how can i ask you to write to me in return i am sure my aunt will never let me receive a letter and yet would it not be worth its weight in gold don't take up sorrow at interest agnes replied mary laughing i don't think your dragon will be so fierce as that either i can hardly imagine she would refuse to let you correspond with me agnes endeavoured to return her smile but she blushed and faltered as she said i mean mary that she would not pay postage for me impossible cried miss peters indignantly you cannot speak seriously i know my mother does not believe a word about her very large fortune any more than she does her very generous intention of leaving it to us but she says that my uncle must have left something like a respectable income for her and though we none of us doubt not even elizabeth that she will marry with all possible speed and when she has found a husband with all her worldly goods will him endow still till this happens it is hardly likely she will refuse to pay the postage of your letters perhaps she will not said agnes blushing again for saying what she did not think but at any rate try the experiment dearest mary to know that you have thought of me will be comfort inexpressible and suppose mr frederick stephenson were to ramble back to clifton agnes and suppose he were to ask me which way you are gone may i tell him he will never ask you mary but and if he should persisted miss peters 
then tell him that it would be a great deal more kind and amiable if he never talked about me to any one arrived at cheltenham mrs barnaby set about the business of finding a domicile with much more confidence and savoir-faire than heretofore a very few inquiries made her decide upon choosing to place herself at a boarding-house and though the price rather startled her she not only selected the dearest but indulged in the expensive luxury of a handsome private sitting-room i know what i am about thought she faint heart never won fair lady and sparing hand never won gay gentleman it was upon the same principle that within three days after her arrival she had found a tiger and got his dress resplendent with buttons from top to toe sent home to her private apartments and likewise that she had determined to enter her name as a subscriber at the pump-room the day after all this was completed was the first upon which she accounted her cheltenham existence to begin and having informed herself of the proper hours and fitting costume for each of the various stated times of appearing at the different points of reunion she desired agnes carefully to brush the dust from her immortal black crape bonnet and with her own features sheltered by pie de fantaisie straw-coloured ribbons and brussels lace she set forth leaning on the arm of her niece and followed by her tiger and parasol to take her first draught at the spring at eight o'clock in the morning her spirits rose as she approached the fount on perceiving the throng of laughing gay and gossiping invalids that bon ton and bile had brought together and when she held out her hand to receive the glass she had more the air of a full-grown bacchante celebrating the rites of bacchus than a votary at the shrine of hygeia but no sooner had the health-restoring but nauseous beverage touched her lips or rather her palate than making a horrible grimace she set down the glass on the marble slab and pushed it from her with very visible symptoms of disgust a moment's reflection made her turn her head to see if agnes was looking at her but no agnes indeed stood at no great distance but her whole attention seemed captivated by a tall elegant-looking woman who together with an old lady leaning on her arm appeared like herself to be occupied as spectators of the water-drinking throng satisfied that her strong distaste for the unsavoury draught had not been perceived mrs barnaby backed out of the crowd saying as she took the arm of her niece in her way this water must be very fine medicine i am sure for those who want it but i don't think i shall venture upon any more of it until i have taken medical advice it is certainly very powerful and i think it might do you a vast deal of good agnes these words being spoken in the widow's audible tone which she always rather desired than not should make her presence known at some distance excepting indeed when she was making love were very distinctly heard by the ladies above mentioned and the elder of them having witnessed mrs barnaby's look of disgust as she set down her unemptied glass laughed covertly and quietly but with much merriment saying though rather to herself than her companion good very good indeed this will prove an acquisition a turn or two up and down the noble walk upon which the pump-room opens was rendered very delightful to the widow by showing her that even at that early hour many dashing-looking lace-frocked men moustached and whiskered to the top of her bent might be met sauntering there and having enjoyed this till her watch told her the boarding-house breakfast hour was arrived she turned from the fascinating promenade in excellent spirits and after a few minutes passed at the mirror in arranging her cap and curls and refreshing her bloom entered for the first time the public eating-room well disposed to enjoy herself in every way having left the peters family behind her she no longer thought it necessary to restrain her fancy in the choice of colours and excepting occasionally on a provincial stage it would be difficult to find a costume more brilliant in its various hues than that of our widow as she followed the obsequious waiter to the place assigned her agnes came after her like a tranquil moonlit night following the meretricious glare of noisy fireworks the dazzled sight that had been drawn to mrs barnaby as she entered rested upon agnes as if to repose itself and by the time they were both seated it was on her fair delicate face and mourning garb that every eye was fixed the vicarial crape and bombasine which she wore in compliance with the arrangement of her too sensitive aunt did agnes at least one service among strangers for it precluded the idea of any near relationship between her companion and herself and though no one could see them together without marvelling at the discordant fellowship of two persons so remarkably contrasted in manner and appearance none explained it by presuming that they were aunt and niece the party assembled and assembling at the breakfast-table consisted of fourteen gentlemen and five ladies 
the rest of the company inhabiting the extensive and really elegant mansion preferring to breakfast in their own apartments though there were few who did not condescend to abandon their privacy at dinner of the gentlemen now present about half were of that lemon tint which at first glance showed their ostensible reason for being there was the real one of the other half it would be less easy to render an account the five ladies were well dressed and two being old and three young they may be said for the most part to have been well looking any more accurate description of them generally would but encumber and delay the narrative unnecessarily as such among them as may come particularly in contact with my heroine or her niece will of necessity be brought into notice our two ladies were of course placed side by side mrs barnaby being flanked to the right by a staid and sober gentleman of middle age who happily acted as a wet blanket to the crackling and sparkling vivacity of the widow obliging her after one or two abortive attempts at conversation and such a sort of boarding-table agacerie as the participation of coffee and eggs may give room for either to eat her breakfast in silence or to exercise her social propensities on the neighbour of agnes this was an elderly lady who though like mrs barnaby but just arrived for the season had unlike her been a constant visitor at cheltenham for the last twelve years and being an active-minded spinster of tolerably easy means and completely mistress of them was as capable of giving all sorts of local information as mrs barnaby was desirous of receiving it miss morrison such was her name being now and having ever been a lady of great prudence and most unimpeachable discretion might probably have taken fright had she chanced at first meeting with our widow to see her under full sail in chase of conquest but luckily this was not apparent at their first interview and the appearance and manner of agnes offering something like a guarantee for the respectability of the lady to whose charge she was entrusted she met mrs barnaby's advances towards making an acquaintance with great civility before many sentences had been exchanged between them the spinster had the satisfaction of perceiving that all her minute acquaintance with cheltenham and its ways gave her an immeasurable superiority over her richly dressed new acquaintance while the widow with like facility discovered that all she most particularly desired to know might be learned from the very respectable-looking individual near whom her good fortune had placed her the consequence of this mutual discovery was so brisk an exchange of question and answer as obliged agnes to lean back in her chair and eat her breakfast by means of a very distant communication with the table but she was thankful her aunt had fallen upon a quiet though rather singular-looking female of forty instead of another whiskered major allen and willingly placed herself in the attitude least likely to interrupt their conversation never been at cheltenham before really well ma'am i have little doubt that you will soon declare it shall not be your last visit though it is your first said miss morrison indeed ma'am i think you will prove right in that opinion replied mrs barnaby for i never saw a place i admired so much we are just come from clifton which is called so beautiful but it is not to be compared to cheltingham you are just come from clifton are you ma'am i understand it is a very beautiful place but terribly dull i believe when compared to this if a person knows cheltingham well and has a little notion how to take advantage of all that is going on he may pass months and months here without ever knowing what it is to have an idle hour i don't believe there is such another place in the whole world for employing time i am sure that's a blessing replied mrs barnaby earnestly if there is one thing i dread and hate more than another it is having nothing to do with my time idleness is indeed the root of all evil i'm pleased to hear you say so ma'am said miss morrison because it is so exactly my own opinion and because too you will find yourself so particularly well off here as to the avoiding it and i shall be very happy i'm sure if any advice of mine may put you in the way of making the most of the advantages in that line that cheltenham offers you are exceedingly kind and obliging ma'am returned mrs barnaby very graciously and i shall be very grateful for any counsel or instruction you can bestow with my handsome fortune i should consider it quite a crime if i did not put my time to profit in such a place as cheltenham this phrase produced its proper effect miss morrison eyed the speaker not only with increased respect but increased goodwill indeed my dear madam you are quite right she said and by merely paying attention to such information as i shall be able to give you i will venture to say that you will never have the weight of an idle hour upon your hands while you remain here 
for what with the balls and the music at the libraries and the regular hours for the walks and attendance at all the sales and i assure you we have sometimes three in a day and shopping and driving between the turnpikes if you have a carriage and morning visits and evening parties and churches and chapels if you have a taste for them and looking over the new names and the pump-room and making new acquaintance and finding out old ones there is not a day of the week or an hour in the day in which one may not be well employed i am sure ma'am it is perfectly a pleasure to a person of my active turn of mind to listen to such a description and it is a greater pleasure still to meet with a lady like yourself with taste and good sense to value what is valuable and to find out how and where to enjoy it i hope we shall become better acquainted i have a private drawing-room here where i shall be delighted to see you give me leave to present you with my card a gilt-edged and deeply embossed card inscribed mrs barnaby the blank hotel and boarding-house number five was here put into miss morrison's hand who received it with an air of great satisfaction and reiterated assurances that she would by no means fail of paying her compliments unlike many vain persons who receive every civility under the persuasion that it is offered for their own beaux yeux miss morrison had sufficient good sense and experience to understand that any convenience or advantage she might derive from mrs barnaby or mrs barnaby's private drawing-room must be repaid by accommodation of some sort or other all obligations of such kind were for a variety of excellent reasons always repaid by miss morrison with such treasure as her own lips could coin aided by her wit and wisdom without drawing on any other exchequer and now having placed her little modest slip of pasteboard bearing in broad and legible though manuscript characters miss morrison the blank hotel and boarding-house by the side of mrs barnaby's buttered roll she began at once like an honest old maid as she was to pay the debt almost before it was incurred i don't know how they do those sort of things at clifton mrs barnaby she said but here the medical gentlemen or at least many of them always call on the newcomers and though i hope and trust that neither you nor this pretty young lady who i suppose is your visitor though i hope with all my heart that you won't either of you have any occasion in the world for physic or doctors yet i advise you most certainly to fix on one in your own mind beforehand and just let him know it there are not more kind and agreeable acquaintances in the world than gentlemen of the medical profession at least i am sure it is so here there are one or two apothecaries in particular surgeons though i believe they are called who certainly are as elegant conversable gentlemen as can be met with in london or anywhere unless indeed just in paris where i certainly found the apothecaries like everything else in a very out of the common way style of elegance tout à fait parfait as we say on the continent of course you have been abroad mrs barnaby no miss morrison i have not replied the widow making head against this attack with great skill and courage i am obliged to confess that the extreme comfort and elegance of my own home have absolutely made a prisoner of me hitherto but since i have lost my dear husband i find change absolutely necessary for my health and spirits and i shall probably soon make the tour of europe indeed oh dear how i envy you but you speak all the languages already oh perfectly i am so glad of that mrs barnaby for upon my word i find it quite out of my power to avoid using a french word every now and then since i came from abroad and it is so vexing when one is not understood a lady of your station has of course been taught by all sorts of foreigners but those who can't afford this indulgence never do get the accent without going abroad i'm sure you'll find before you have been a week on the continent a most prodigious difference in your accent though i dare say it's very good already but a propos about the apothecaries and surgeons that i was talking about i hope you will give orders at the door that if mr alexander pringle calls and sends in his card he shall be desired to walk up and then you know just a propos de nang you can talk to him about whatever you wish to know and you can say if you like that miss morrison particularly mentioned his name there is no occasion du tout that you should give him any fee but you may ask him a few questions about the waters comme ça and you will find him the most agreeable convenient and instructive acquaintance de monde the breakfast was now so evidently drawing to its close that the new friends deemed it advisable to leave the table and mrs barnaby having repeated her invitation and miss morrison having replied to it by kissing her fingers and uttering mercy mercy au revoir they parted 
the widow to give orders as she passed to her drawing-room that if mr alexander pringle called on her he should be admitted and the spinster to invent and fabricate in the secret retirement of her attic retreat some of those remarkably puzzling articles of dress the outline of which she had studied during a three weeks residence in paris and which passed current with the majority of her friends and acquaintance for being of genuine gallic manufacture the prediction of miss morrison was speedily verified mr alexander pringle did call at the hotel to leave his card for mrs barnaby and in consequence of the orders given was immediately admitted to her presence she was alone for agnes though unfortunately there was no little dear miserable closet for her had received the welcome conge now always expressed by the words there you may go to your lessons child if you will and had withdrawn herself to an out-of-the-way corner in their double-bedded room where already her desk and other empton treasures had converted about four feet square of her new abode into a home the sofa therefore with the table and its gaudy cover adorned with the widow's fine work-box a boarding-house inkstand of bright-coloured china and the album still sacred in the name of isabella d'almafonte had all been set in the places and attitudes she thought most becoming by mrs barnaby herself and together with her own magnificent person formed a very charming picture as the medical gentleman entered the room but it is probable mr alexander pringle expected rather to find a patient than to be ushered into the presence of a lady in a state of health apparently so perfect pray sit down sir mr pringle i believe said mrs barnaby half rising and pointing to a chair exactly opposite her place on the sofa mr pringle took the indicated chair but before he was well seated in it the idea that some mistake might be the source of this civility occurred to him and he rose again made a step forward and laid his cards specifying his name profession and address on the table immediately before the eyes of the lady oh yes said she smiling with amiable condescension i understand perfectly and should myself or my young niece or any of my servants require medical assistance mr pringle this card placing it carefully in her work-box will enable us to find it but though at present we are all pretty well i am really very glad to have an opportunity of seeing you sir miss morrison i believe you know miss morrison mr pringle bowed miss morrison has named you to me in a manner that made me extremely desirous of making your acquaintance gentlemen of your profession mr pringle have so much knowledge of the world that it is a great advantage for a stranger on first arriving at a new place to find an opportunity of conversing with them will you afford me five minutes while i explain to you my very peculiar situation assuredly madam replied mr pringle i shall be most happy to listen to you well then without farther apology i will explain myself my name is barnaby i am a widow of good fortune and without children for i have lost both my little ones here mrs barnaby drew forth one of her embroidered handkerchiefs as she always did when speaking of her children which were not and this frequently happened for she had a great dislike to being considered as one unblessed by offspring a peculiarity which together with some others displaying themselves in the same inventive strain proved an especial blessing to agnes inasmuch as it made her absence often desirable having wiped her eyes and recovered her emotion she continued i have no children but an elder sister so much older indeed as almost to be considered as my mother died several years ago leaving an orphan girl to my care in truth i am not a great many years older than my niece and the anxiety of this charge has been sometimes almost too much for me however she is a good girl and i am most passionately attached to her nevertheless she has some peculiarities which give me pain one is that she will never wear any dress but the deepest mourning thus consecrating herself as i may say to the memory of her departed parents now this whim mr pringle shows her spirits to be in a state requiring change of scene and it is on this account that i have left my charming place in devonshire in the hope that variety and a gayer circle than is likely to be found in the immediate neighbourhood of a large mansion in the country might be of service to her indeed ma'am i think you are quite right replied mr pringle what age is the young lady just seventeen and i should have no objection whatever to take her into company and this is indeed the point on which i most wish for your advice i came to cheltenham sir fully expecting to find my friends the gordons near relations of the duke and persons of first-rate fashion and consequence who would at once have placed us in the midst of all that is most elegant in the way of society here 
but by a letter they sent to meet us at clifton i find that they are absolutely obliged to pay a visit of some weeks to the duchess of bedford and thus i find myself here a perfect stranger without any means whatever of getting into society a most vexatious contretemps certainly madam replied mr pringle but there can be no doubt of your obtaining quite as much society as you wish for cheltenham is extremely full just now and a lady in your situation of life can hardly fail of meeting some of your acquaintance of course you will go to the pump-room mrs barnaby and look over the subscription books and i doubt not you will soon find there are many here whom you know besides i will myself if you wish it take care to make it known that you intend to enter into society and probably intend to receive indeed sir you will oblige me on my own account i should certainly never particularly desire to make acquaintance with strangers but there is nothing i would not be willing to do for this dear girl of course i shall make a point of subscribing to everything and particularly of taking my poor dear niece to all the balls she is really very pretty and if i can but contrive to get suitable partners for her i think dancing may be of great service are there many of the nobility here at present mr pringle yes madam several and a great deal of good company besides that gives us a better chance of finding old acquaintance certainly but there is another point mr pringle on which i am anxious to consult you my niece is decidedly very bilious and i feel quite convinced that a glass of the water every morning would be of the most essential benefit to her unfortunately dear creature she is quite a spoiled child and i do not think she will be prevailed on to take what is certainly not very pleasant to the taste unless ordered to do it by a medical man i must see the young lady ma'am replied mr pringle before i can venture to prescribe for her in any way mrs barnaby internally wished him less scrupulous but feeling that it would be better he should send in a bill and charge a visit than that she should lose a daily excuse for visiting the delightful pump-room and moreover feeling more strongly still that in order to make agnes swallow the dose instead of herself it would be good economy to pay for half a dozen visits she rose from the sofa and said with a fascinating smile i will bring her to you myself my dear sir but i hope you will not disappoint me about prescribing the cheltenham waters for her i know her constitution well and i venture to pledge myself to you that she is exactly the subject for the cheltenham treatment so bilious poor girl so dreadfully bilious mrs barnaby left the room and presently returned with agnes who was considerably surprised at being told that it was necessary a medical man should see her for in the first place save a heaviness at her heart she felt quite well and in the second she had never before since she left empton perceived any great anxiety on the part of her aunt as to her being well or ill however she yielded implicit obedience to the command which bade her leave the letter she was writing to miss peters and meekly followed her imperious protectress to their sitting-room mr alexander pringle was decidedly a clever man and clever men of his profession are generally skilful in discerning diagnostics of various kinds he had expected to see a yellow heavy-eyed girl looking either as if she were ready to cry with melancholy or pout from perverseness instead of which he saw a lovely graceful creature with a step elastic with youth and health and an eye whose clear intelligent glance said as plainly as an eye could speak what would you with me i have no need of you he immediately perceived that the amiable child bereaved widow had quite misunderstood the young lady's case it might be perhaps from her too tender affection but let the cause be what it would it was not to solve any professional doubts that he took her delicate hand to feel the healthful music of her pulse nevertheless mr pringle who had seven promising children knew better than to reject the preferred custom of a rich widow who had none so looking at his beautiful patient with much gravity he said there is little or nothing madam to alarm you the young lady is rather pale but i am inclined to believe that it rather proceeds from the naturally delicate tint of her complexion than from illness you will be proper however that i should see her again and meantime i would strongly recommend her taking about one-third of a glass of water daily if more be found necessary the dose must be increased but i am inclined to hope that this will prove sufficient with the help of a few tablespoons of a mixture by no means disagreeable my dear young lady which i will not fail to send in and so saying mr pringle rose to take leave but was somewhat puzzled by agnes saying with a half smile in which there was something that looked very much as if she were quizzing him you must excuse me sir if i decline taking any medicine whatever till i feel myself in some degree out of health 
mr pringle who was very near laughing himself answered with great good humour well then mrs barnaby i suppose we must do without it and i don't think there will be much danger either he then took his departure leaving mrs barnaby quite determined that agnes should drink the water but not very sorry that she was to have no physic to pay for whilst agnes was altogether at a loss to guess what this new vagary of her aunt might mean what made you think i was ill aunt said she ill who told you child that i thought you ill i don't think any such thing but i did not choose you should drink the waters till i had the opinion of the first medical man in the place about it there is no expense no sacrifice agnes that i am not ready to make for you but i don't mean to drink the waters at all thank you aunt replied agnes don't mean miss you don't mean and perhaps you don't mean to eat any dinner to-day and perhaps you don't mean to sleep in my apartment to-night perhaps you may prefer walking the streets all night pretty language indeed from you to me and now you may take yourself off again and as you like to stick to your lessons you may just go and write for a copy i must do as i'm bid agnes quitted the room in silence and mrs barnaby prepared to receive her new friend miss morrison who she doubted not would call before the hour she had named as the fashionable time for repairing to the public library nor was she at all displeased by this abrupt departure as for obvious reasons it was extremely inconvenient for her to have agnes present when she felt inclined to enter upon a little autobiography but while anticipating this agreeable occupation she recalled as she set herself to work upon one of her beautiful collars the scrape she had got into respecting her park and firmly resolved not even to mention a paddock to miss morrison by name whatever other flights of fancy she might indulge in this has been no idle day with me as yet thought she as she proceeded with her elegant satin stitch i have got well stared at though only in my clothes straw bonnet at the pump-room have made a capital new acquaintance and remembering with a self-approving smile all she had said to mr pringle i know i have not been sowing seed on barren ground i have not forgotten how glad my poor dear barnaby was to get hold of something new he will repeat it every word i'll answer for him End of chapter twelve volume two chapter thirteen of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen the acquaintance ripens into friendship useful information of all sorts an excellent method of talking french attended with little labour and certain success a collector a sale-room a peer of the realm the visit of miss morrison which quickly followed was long and confidential mrs barnaby very condescendingly explained to her all the peculiar circumstances of her position which rendered her the most valuable friend in the world and also the most eligible match extant for a man of rank and fortune but all these latter particulars were communicated under the seal of secrecy never upon any account to be alluded to or mentioned to any one and in return for all this miss morrison gave the widow a catalogue a raisonne of the most marriageable men at present in cheltenham together with the best accounts of their rent-rolls and expectancies that it had been in the power of pertinacious questionings to elicit but it would be superfluous to narrate this part of the conversation at length as the person and affairs of many a goodly gentleman were canvassed therein who as they never became of much importance to mrs barnaby can be of none to those occupied by the study of her character and adventures there were other points however canvassed in this interview which were productive of immediate results and one of these was the great importance of attending the sales by auction which sometimes preluded by soft music and always animated as they went on by the most elegant conversation occupied the beau monde of cheltenham for many hours of every day your descriptions are delightful miss morrison exclaimed the animated widow i could almost fancy myself there already and go i will constantly you may depend upon that and i want to consult you about another thing miss morrison there's my niece you know the little girl you saw at breakfast do you think it would be quite the thing to make her leave her books and lessons and all that to waste her time at the sales and besides baby as she is she gets more staring at than i think at all good for her j'ai n'a doute pas replied miss morrison for she is divinely handsome c'est tout beau t'es parfait as they say at paris 
and my belief is that if you wish to be the fashion at cheltenham the best thing you can do is to let her be seen every day and all day long that face and figure must take say claire mrs barnaby fell into a reverie that lasted some minutes that she did wish to be the fashion at cheltenham was certain but the beauty of agnes was not exactly the means by which she would best like to obtain her wish she had hoped to depend solely on her own beauty and her own talents but she was not insensible to the manifest advantage of having two strings to her bow and as the ambition which made her determined to be great was quite as powerful as the vanity which made her determined to be beautiful the scheme of making agnes a partner in her projects of fascination and conquest was at least worthy of consideration i must think about it miss morrison she replied there is no occasion to decide this minute why do too said miss morrison i always like myself to walk round a thing as i call it before i decide to take it besides my dear madam a great deal depends upon knowing what is your principal object beaucoup de pont de cela if you intend to be at all the parties to be marked with a buzz every time you enter the pump-room the ball-room or the sales i would say dress up that young lady in the most elegant and attractive style possible and you will be sure to succeed pas le moindre doute de cela but if on the other hand your purpose is to marry yourself c'est autre chose and you must act altogether in a different way i understand you my dear miss morrison perfectly replied the widow greatly struck by the sound sense and clear perception of her new friend and i will endeavour with the most perfect frankness to make you understand all my plans for i feel sure that you deserve my full confidence and that nobody can be more capable of giving me good advice the truth is miss morrison that i do wish to marry again my fortune indeed is ample enough to afford me every luxury i can wish for but a widowed heart my dear miss morrison a widowed heart is a heavy load to bear where the temper like mine is full of the softest sensibility and all the tenderest affections therefore as i said it is my wish to marry again but god forbid i should be weak and wicked enough to do so in any way unbecoming my station in society a station to which i have every right as well from birth as fortune no attachment however strong will ever induce me to forget what i owe to my family and to the world and unless circumstances shall enable me rather to raise and debase myself in society i will never whatever my feelings may be permit myself to marry at all croyez moi vous avez raison chère dame exclaimed miss morrison such being the case resumed the widow it appears to me evident that the first object to be attended to is the getting into good society and if in order to obtain it i find it necessary to bring forward agnes willoughby it must certainly be done especially as her singing is much more remarkable i believe than even the beauty of her person et, et possible said miss morrison joyfully then in that case cher ame there is nothing in the world of any sort or kind that can prevent your being sought out and invited to every fashionable house in the place an ugly girl that sings well may easily get herself asked wherever she chooses to go but a beautiful one a vicar talon semblable may not only go herself but carry with her as many of her friends as she pleases really said mrs barnaby thoughtfully this is a great advantage and you feel sure miss morrison that if i make up my mind to bring her forward this will be the case oh oui replied her friend confidently c'est un fait certain there is no doubt about it and if you will i am ready to make you a bet of five guineas play or pay that if you contrive to make her be seen and heard once you will have your table covered with visiting cards before the end of the week non doute pas well we must consider about it miss morrison but i should like i think to go first to some of these crowded places that you talk about without her just to see that is if you would be kind enough to go with me most certainly i will replied miss morrison avec le plus grand plaisir suppose we go to the sales-room this morning there is a vast variety of most useful and beautiful things to be sold to-day and as they always go for nothing you had better bid a little it is thought stylish and must certainly draw attention said mrs barnaby with vivacity you are quite right say ça and it is just about time to get ready all our gentlemen will be there you may be sure and perhaps you know some one of them may join us which is a great advantage 
for nothing makes women look so much like nobody as having no man near them as to marriage i don't think of it for myself j'ai pris mon parti but i confess i do hate to be anywhere without the chance of a man's coming to speak to one mais il faut mettre mon chapeau au revoir mrs barnaby now found herself at last obliged to confess she did not understand her of course i know french perfectly she said but as i have never been in the country and not much in the habit of speaking it even at home i cannot always follow you i would give a great deal miss morrison to speak the language as beautifully as you do it is a great assistance in society certainly replied miss morrison very modestly but i do assure you that it is quite impossible for anybody in the world to speak it as i do without being in the country and taking the same incessant pains as i did as to learning it from books it is all nonsense to think of it how in the world is one to get the accent and pronunciation but i must say that i believe few people ever learned so much in so short a time as i did i invented a method for myself without which i should never have been able to speak as i do i never was without my pencil and paper in my hand and i wrote down almost every word i heard in such a manner as that i was able to read it myself without asking anybody the english of it all i got easily afterwards for almost everybody understands me when i read my notes according to my own spelling especially english people and these translations i wrote down over against my french which i call making both a grammar and dictionary entirely of my own invention and i have often been complimented upon it i assure you and i am sure you well deserve it i never heard anything so clever in my life replied mrs barnaby but how soon shall we begin our walk now directly if you please i will go and put on my hat that was what i said to you in french il faut mettre mon chapeau mrs barnaby then repaired to her toilette and having done her very utmost to make herself as conspicuously splendid and beautiful as possible turned to agnes who was still writing in her dark corner and said you had better finish what you are about agnes and i hope it is something that will improve you i am going out with miss morrison on business and if the evening is fine i will take you a walk somewhere or other agnes again blessed their rencontre with this valuable new friend and saw the satin and feathers of her aunt disappear with a feeling of great thankfulness that she was spared the necessity of attending them on leaving mrs barnaby mr alexander pringle paid a visit to his good friend and patient lady elizabeth norris the aunt of colonel hubert who as usual was passing a few weeks of the season at cheltenham as much for the sake of refreshing her spirits by the variety of its company as for the advantage of taking a daily glass of water at its spring the worthy apothecary was as useful by the information and gossipings he furnished on the former subject as by his instructions on the latter and was invariably called in the day after her ladyship's arrival however perfect the state of her health might be and given moreover to understand that a repetition of a professional visit would be expected at least three times a week during her stay he now found the old lady sitting alone for sir edward and lady stephenson who were her guests were engaged in one of their favourite morning expeditions exploring the beautiful environs of the town a pleasure which they enjoyed as uninterruptedly as the most sentimental newly married pair could desire as by a strange but very general spirit of economy few of the wealthy and luxurious visitants of cheltingham indulge themselves in the expense of a turnpike so pringle you are come at last are you said lady elizabeth i have been expecting you this hour the stephensons are off and away again to the world's end in search of wild flowers and conjugal romance leaving me to my own devices a privilege worth little or nothing unless you can add something new to my list here for next wednesday perhaps i may be able to assist your ladyship returned her esculapius that is provided lady stephenson knows nothing about it for i fear she has not yet forgiven my introduction of mr myrtle and the two mrs tompkins stuff and nonsense what does it signify now she is married and out of the way what animals i get into my menagerie but i don't think pringle that you are half such a clever truffle dog as you used to be what a time it is since you have told me of anything new upon my word my lady it is not my fault replied the apothecary laughing i never see or hear anything abroad without treasuring it in my memory for your ladyship's service and i am now come expressly to mention a new arrival at the blank which appears to promise well i rejoice is it male or female female my lady and there are two 
of the same species and the same race decidedly not but the contrast produces a very pleasant effect and moreover though infinitely amusing they are quite comme il faut i understand the elder lady is sister to mrs peters of clifton mr pringle then proceeded to describe his visit to mrs barnaby and did justice to the florid style of her beauty dress and conversation but when he came to speak of the young girl who was vouée au noir and of her aunt's pertinacious resolution that she should take the waters and be treated as an invalid notwithstanding the very excellent state of her health the old lady rubbed her hands together and exultingly exclaimed good admirable you are a very fine fellow pringle and have hit this off well why man i saw your delightful widow this morning at the pump rouge ringlets and all i saw her taste the waters and turn sick and now because she must have a reason for showing herself at the pump she is going to make the poor girl drink for her capital creature i understand it all poor little girl and so the widow wants acquaintance does she i offer myself my drawing-room shall be open to her pringle and now how can i manage to get introduced to her you will not find that very difficult lady elizabeth depend upon it i will undertake to promise for this mrs barnaby that she will be visible wherever men and women congregate at the ball for instance to-morrow night does your ladyship intend to be there certainly and if she be there i will manage the matter of introduction with or without intervention and so obtain this full-blown peony for my show on wednesday next whilst fate and mr pringle were thus labouring in one quarter of the town to bring mrs barnaby into notice she was herself not idle in another in her exertions to produce the same effect the sale-room to which the experienced miss morrison led her was already full when they entered it but the little difficulty which preceded their obtaining seats was rather favourable to them than otherwise for as if on purpose to display the sagacity of that lady's prognostications two of the gentlemen who had made part of their company at breakfast not only made room for them but appeared well disposed to enter into conversation and to offer every attention they could desire mr griffiths if i mistake not said miss morrison bowing to one of them i hope you have been quite well sir since we met last year give me leave to introduce mr griffiths mrs barnaby i am happy to make your acquaintance said the gentleman bowing low your young friend whom i saw with you this morning is not here is she no sir replied mrs barnaby in the most amiable tone imaginable the dear girl is pursuing her morning studies at home introduce me griffiths whispered his companion mr patterson mrs barnaby mr patterson miss morrison and a very social degree of intimacy appeared to be immediately established oh what a lovely vase exclaimed mrs barnaby what an elegant set of candlesticks cried miss morrison as the auctioneer brought forward the articles to be bid for which being followed by a variety of interesting observations on nearly all the people and nearly all the goods displayed before them afforded mrs barnaby such an opportunity of being energetic and animated that more than one eyeglass was turned towards her producing that reciprocity of cause and effect which is so interesting to trace for the more the gentlemen and ladies looked at her the more mrs barnaby talked and laughed and the more mrs barnaby talked and laughed the more the gentlemen and ladies looked at her flattered fluttered and delighted beyond measure the eyes of the widow wandered to every quarter of the room and for some time every quarter of the room appeared equally interested to her but at length her attention was attracted by the almost fixed stare of an individual who stood in the midst of a knot of gentlemen at some distance but nearly opposite to the place she occupied can you tell me sir who that tall stout gentleman is in the green frock coat with lace and tassels that one who is looking this way with an eyeglass the gentleman with red hair returned mr patterson to whom the question was addressed yes that one rather sandy but a very fine-looking man that is lord mucklebury mrs barnaby he is a great amateur of beauty and upon my word he seems exceedingly taken with some fair object or other in this part of the room the sight of land after a long voyage is delightful rest is delightful after labour food after fasting but it may be doubted if either of these joys could bear comparison with the emotion that now swelled the bosom of mrs barnaby this was the first time to the best of her knowledge and belief that she had ever been looked at by a lord at all and what a look it was 
no passing glance no slight unmeaning regard directed first to one and then to another beauty but a long steady direct and unshrinking stare such as might have made many women leave the room but which caused the heart of mrs barnaby to palpitate with a degree of ecstasy which she had never felt before no not even when the most admired officer of a new battalion first fixed his looks upon her in former days and advanced in the eyes of all the girls to ask her to dance for no lord anything had ever done so and thus the fulness of her new-born joy while it had the vigorous maturity of ripened age glowed also with the early brightness of youth it might indeed have been said of mrs barnaby at that moment that like mrs malaprop and the orange tree she bore blossom and fruit at once one proof of the youthful freshness of her emotion was the very naive manner in which it was betrayed she could not sit still her eyes rose and fell her head turned and twisted her reticule opened and shut and the happy man who set all this going must have had much less experience than my lord mucklebury if he had not immediately perceived the effect of himself and his eyeglass could mrs barnaby have known at that moment the influence produced by the presence of miss morrison she would have wished her a thousand fathoms deep in the ocean for certain it is that nothing but her well-known little quizzical air of unquestionable cheltenham respectability prevented the noble lord from crossing the room and amusing himself without the ceremony of an introduction in conversing with the sensitive lady whose bright eyes and bright rouge had drawn his attention to her as it was however he thought he had better not and contented himself by turning to his ever useful friend captain singleton and saying in a tone the familiarity of which failed not to make up for its imperiousness singleton go and find out who that great woman is in the green satin and pink feathers there's a good fellow mrs barnaby did not hear the words but she saw the mission as plainly as my lord mucklebury saw her and her heart thereupon began to beat so violently that she had no breath left to demand the sympathy of her friend under circumstances so pregnant with interest but though she hardly knew where she was nor what she did she still retained sufficient presence of mind to mark how the obedient envoy addressed himself and alas in vain first to one lounger and then to another who all replied by a shake of the head which said with terrible distinctness i don't know gracious heaven how provoking murmured mrs barnaby as she pressed her delicately gloved hand upon her heart to still its beating he will leave the room without finding out my name had she been only a few hours longer acquainted with mr patterson it is highly probable she would have desired him if asked by the little gentleman in black so actively making his way through the crowd what her name was just to have the kindness to mention that it was barnaby but though very civil mr patterson was rather ceremonious and the unsuccessful messenger had returned to his lord and delivered all the shakes of the head which he had received condensed into one before she could resolve on so frank a mode of proceeding for a few moments longer however the amused nobleman continued his fascinating gaze and then giving a signal with his eye to singleton that it was his pleasure to move that active personage cleared the way before him and the fat viscount with his hands in his waistcoat pockets stalked out of the room but not without turning his head and giving one bold final open-eyed steady look at the agitated widow that man is my fate she softly whispered to her soul as the last frog on the hinder part of his coat had passed from her eye and then like the tender convolvulus when the sunbeam that reached it has passed away she drooped and faded till she looked more like a sleeping picture of mrs barnaby than mrs barnaby herself do you not find the room very close miss morrison said she after enduring for a minute or two the sort of vacuum that seemed to weigh upon her senses Point du tout replied miss morrison speaking through her nose which was one method by which she was wont to convey the true parisian accent when she desired that it should be particularly perfect point du tout mrs barnaby however i am quite ready to go if you like it for i don't think i shall buy anything this morning and i don't see many acquaintance here mrs barnaby immediately rose the two civil gentlemen made way for them and the widow followed by her friend walked out a more pensive though not perhaps a less happy woman than when she walked in End of chapter 13